Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this panel discussion, Europe in Crisis, the End of the European Dream, co-hosted by the School of Social and Political Sciences and the Centre for Public Policy as part of our Challenging Crises series. Uh, my name's Helen Sullivan. I'm Professor and Director of the Centre for Public Policy, and I'll be your host for this evening. Thank you all for coming uh, to what I'm sure will be a lively and thought-provoking event, followed by a very refreshing reception, which you are all very welcome to stay for. Um, this event has been incredibly popular, so much so that we've had to rebook the venue um, to fit you all in. So I'm hoping that you've all brought your questions and opinions with you to, to quiz our panel this evening. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, who are the traditional owners of this land. I would like to pay respect to the elders of the Kulin Nation, both past and present, and extend that respect to any other Indigenous Australians present. The European Union is facing its greatest challenge ever. The Eurozone is on the verge of collapse. Old tensions and new conflict among the countries emerge with each attempt to solve the crisis. Yet the crisis remains misunderstood, and the proposed solutions are not up to the mark. Is this a crisis of currency? a collapse of economies due to corruption, a crisis of legitimacy, or a vacuum of leadership? Could it be all of these? Can Europe be saved? And what is it about Europe that is worth saving? Is Europe really a small corner of paradise, as one EU leader recently suggested? Or is it nothing more than a giant theme park, as one very eminent Australian statesman said to me earlier this year? Our panel of experts, some of whom are European, um, will look at these difficult questions and explore some possible answers. Um, so before we kick off and I'll and explain the format to you, I'd like to introduce the panel uh, in the order in which they'll speak. Uh, we begin with Philomena Murray, who is known to many of you in this room, Associate Professor in the School of Social and Political Sciences, and Jean Monnet Chair ad personum at the School of, of Social and Political Sciences here at the University of Melbourne. She holds honorary positions in a number of universities all over the world um, and is the author and co-author of a number of books on the EU and related issues. Um, and she is also co-editor of a forthcoming volume with Thomas Christiansen and Emil Kirchner, The Palgrave Handbook of EU-Asia Relations, which will be published next year and has, I think, 45 chapters. Is that right? So you won't be able to afford it, but it'll be well worth reading. <laughs> Michael Hertzfeld, who's sitting immediately next to, to Philo, is Professor of Anthropology at Harvard University and is a regular visitor to us here at the University of Melbourne. He's authored 10 books, including A Place in History, Cultural Intimacy, The Body in Politic, and Evicted from Eternity. And he's produced two ethnographic films about Rome, so he is a multi-talented, multi-skilled academic. He served as, as editor and co-editor on numerous publications, but the most interesting one is, to me at least, is his editor-at-large role um, for Anthropological Quarterly, where he's responsible for polyglot perspectives. Um, and I'm sure he'll be bringing some of that to his contribution this evening. Next to Michael is another Michael, uh, Dr. Michael Longo, who's Associate Professor in Law at the Faculty of Business and Law at Victoria University here in Melbourne. He's published in the areas of European Union law, constitutional law, international law, and comparative constitutional systems. His publications include Constitutionalising Europe, Processes and Practices, and European Union Law and Australian View. And last but not least, uh, Professor Leslie Holmes, who's been a professor here at the school um, since 1988. Um, and was either director or deputy director of the Contemporary Europe Research Centre until 2009. Les's teaching and research specialisations are in corruption and in organised crime, with particular reference to Central and Eastern Europe. He's authored or co-authored or co-edited more than 14 books, most of these which focus on Europe. He was president of the International Council for Central and East European Studies and has been a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia since 1995. Les has recently retired from the faculty, um, and one of the fascinating things that, that, that all recently retired faculty members tell you is that they've never been so busy since they've retired. Um, so we're particularly grateful to Les for joining us this evening. So the format, I promised I'd let you know about the format. The way we're going to work this this evening is that each contributor will be able to make an opening um, comment uh, for up to 10 minutes. They're not required to take 10 minutes, but they may. They've been asked to do that from this lectern, so they can do it free and uninhibited from any interference. Um, we will be keeping them strictly to time. 
Once each contributor has made their contribution, we will then have a panel discussion where we'll pick up on key themes and issues that I think are particularly interesting. Um, and I will ask the panel to discuss those for, for 10 to 15 minutes. We will then throw the discussion open to you. Um, so there will be plenty of time for Q&A um, before we ask the panel to give us their, their final thoughts. And then we will round up and continue the discussion um, at the reception. So that's how we're going to do it. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker, Philomena Murray. Philo. Thank you, Helen. Um, it's great to be here. I was terribly tempted to say there is no crisis and walk off again, um, but I knew Helen would kill me. Um, I think my theme tonight is really that you should never waste a good crisis, and I think the European Union is wasting a good crisis, a crisis that it could emerge from with a great deal of legitimacy and with a great deal of integrity, and I don't think at the moment it is doing that. It is partly because there is an element of path dependency there. The European Union has always been in crisis. It's been estimated by one observer, uh, who was also president of the European Commission, that it's been in crisis about two-thirds of it, its existence. It was created out of crisis. I've been Googling crisis in Europe for some years now. Got about 5 million the first time, 20 million the second time. Now I've got 500 and million, 519 million entries for Europe in crisis or crisis in Europe. Um, and that can be prugled, I understand. That is proving a fact using um, Google, which no doubt is what you all do during my lectures. So it was created out of crisis. It was a crisis of the nation states, and it still is a crisis of the nation states. It is also a crisis uh, and a conflict between EU ideals and interests on the one hand and national interests on the other. There have been benefits and there have been sacrifices on both sides, especially sacrifices of sovereignty, and particularly in the European integration bargain. Whatever the benefits, however, the EU does not command loyalty, interest or indeed much admiration from its citizens. And that is despite the fact that the EU has decided on a European flag, which we're all supposed to respect with a great deal of um, enthusiasm. I'm not so sure that wearing this hat actually does make me feel, for instance, more European. But that is actually part of the serious legitimacy crisis, the recognition of the salience of the European European Union. Whatever the benefits, it does have a loyalty crisis. It does also have a leadership problem because not only is there not a European sense of loyalty, but many of the national leaders themselves have played the nationalism versus Europeanism game so well that they also are now playing national agendas that a common European context of hope, um, a narrative of hope, is simply not evident. The narrative of hope and of rebuilding is not something that you had, um, that, that you can see now compared to the early days. And the problem is that the European Union is very much a project, a, a, a project of hope, but it's also the product of its origins. And those origins have also stymied the elements that are in conflict now. It has meant that the European Union has chosen a treaty-based institutional solution to every problem, quite often totally um, separated from the people. I remember talking to the person in charge of the People's Europe Initiative to try and have people more involved in European Union processes and decision making and the creating of what is now being called a public space for European contestation. And I said to him, you know, tell me more about the People's Europe. He said, oh no, I can't tell you about that. And I said, well, who are you talking to? And he said, well, nobody really. I'm just trying to make it up. And I think this is one of the problems with the European Union, that there is an element of being um, separated um, from the people. And so that great sense of Europe being a solution, a solution and not the problem, a, to, a solution to war through peace, a solution to economic deprivation through growth, to isolation and irrelevance by attempts to become a soft power or a normative power. Now what we see is the European Union is seen as the problem. The European Union is seen as compounding the problems taking place at the moment. And that, I think, is a major problem. I also think that having one of the EU's, the EU's leaders um, Herman van Rompuy saying, despite all of its problems, Europe is still a small, 
place, a small part of paradise, really does not have resonance. When you've got 55% youth unemployment initially in Greece, when you have no narrative of hope, but rather what it comes across is very much a narrative of complacency. And this is partly due to that path dependency that the European Union has always chosen a treaty-based approach. Um, Nick Cox has always said, um, from the LSE, he's always said, um, whenever there's a war, he said, um, in order to deal with responses, he said, the United States always reaches for a gun and the Europeans reach for a treaty. Um, both of those are, of course, not terribly fair to either side. But nevertheless, there is a sense that the of a capabilities expectations gap. The European Union is creating and has long created expectations. Those capabilities aren't there and they cannot be there until the member states come to the party. And that means that the European Union, instead of being a leader, is actually learning not leadership but followership. That doesn't sit well with many people at the European Union leadership. And I think that this is partly because of that highly institutionalised pattern of practice and practice of decision making, where there was a permissive consensus that the member states, the individual countries, the constituent states, didn't bother to consult the people. And that is why when the Greek, former Greek Prime Minister actually dared to say, let's have a referendum, let's have a referendum on a bailout, let's talk about this seriously, the European Stability Mechanism. And, and this was regarded with considerable scorn by many national European leaders, um, partly because in the past people didn't vote the way they, quote, should have voted um, in favour of European Union constitutional change, such as the Treaty of Nice, the Treaty of Maastricht, the Treaty of Lisbon. And I come from a country, for those of you who have noticed I have a tiny accent, um, but I come from a country where they tend to vote against treaties quite a bit, and that includes my mum. Um, and one of the uh, problems is also that the solution is unfortunately constitutionalized and, and treatified without any sense of participatory democracy, that the answer is now being called in European Union circles more Europe. The European Union is not just Europe, as I tell the students regularly, and Europe is not just the European Union. But this idea of more Europe, that the only solution is going to be more integration, may well be true. But it cannot be presented in an elitist manner in which you've got fight, infighting among member states and you've got the so-called good countries and the bad countries. Some of those countries did not obey the rules. It is absolutely clear. There, were, there was corruption. There, was a, um, there were countries that should probably never have joined the European Union. They were admitted under very, very dodgy circumstances, to put it mildly. And so what we have now is what's looking like the end of a European dream. The dream that does have a lot of good of good. It's got the um, Charter of Fundamental Rights, for instance, um, for um, citizens. And here's one I prepared earlier. This is the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which gets distributed at schools um, throughout Europe. And you can get it in every single language. Um, so there, this, that sort of fundamental rights, the rights um, to not, for instance, ha to have to have a death penalty, the right to um, rights in the workplace, all of these are part of what the European Union considers to be a dream. It has a great deal of validity. It's the only international entity which has redistributive pa practices throughout um, the entire re set of regions and indeed throughout the countries. It's got protection for workers' rights, for gender rights, for disability rights, assistance for small and medium-sized enterprises. It actually has attempted to try and be a good international citizen. It has done this by, for instance, contributing 60% of world development assistance, two-thirds of world humanitarian assistance. That's not inconsiderable from coming from a small corner of paradise. It's involved increasingly in civilian crisis management and in humanitarian assistance. But the problem is that much of its dream doesn't resonate with the people. And as long as the EU remains deeply embedded in only institutionalised elitist solutions without recognition of their relevance for youth and for others in crisis, then and I think the European Union hasn't lived up to that dream of peace, of stability and of economic growth. The nation state and the EU, I would like to wager, will remain obstinate and not obsolete. They will continue to exist. But because crisis is the default position of the European Union and has been, what we see is a huge amount, drawing on Hirschman, a huge amount of um, desire to exit, a lot of desire to voice, 
dissent, but unfortunately, very little loyalty. And so while you've got this barren landscape of uh, crucial policy making, which is actually not actually making sense, being crippled by a path dependency and a considerable lack of courage, I think then we're going to still have problems with the European Union in its crisis of legitimacy, its crisis of democracy, and its crisis of relevance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, indeed, the European Union is in crisis, and it is also corrupt. I believe that the EU is a corrupt institution, and this is the frame that I'm going to use for my introductory comments. Um, it cannot but be corrupt because it is a human, financial, and political institution, and it has emphasized its corruption uh, through the lack of democracy through which many of its decisions are made. These are not made through direct democratic processes, but by sometimes elected, sometimes appointed, sometimes apparently self-appointed officials. And the entire system of the EU, as the anthropologist Douglas Holmes pointed out some years ago, is constructed according to the same bureaucratic logic as the Vatican. Indeed, its founders were many of them pupils of Jacques Maritain and followed him in uh, upholding the principle of subsidiarity as a key organizational principle, which means that accountability is not distributed in the same way as it is in the democratic systems uh, that comprise uh, the nation states of Europe. It is also grounded, unfortunately, in attitudes that partly spring from this same uh, religious tradition. When speakers as widely different as Valéry Giscard d'Estaing and Pope Benedict XVI insist that Europe is a Christian continent, they offend those of us who are European but not Christian, and indeed they also make a statement that anthropologically is simply nonsensical because you cannot have a continent, which is a geographical mass, defined by a cultural feature, which is, in this case, religion. Moreover, this kind of thinking leads to the proliferation of stereotypes, and it is not surprising that since the creation of the U European Union, we have seen a considerable proliferation of far-right extremism, and I'll come to that point again in a moment. As they say in Greece, the fish thinks from the head, and this particular fish stinks rather badly of stereotypes, particularly since the leaders of the more powerful countries seem to be more inclined to dismiss other countries in stereotypical terms than to analyze their own problems. Thus, when Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, claims that the, uh, that the Greeks are lazy, she is in fact overlooking a statistic that puts the Greeks as working far more hours per week, along with the Austrians, interestingly enough, than do the Germans. Uh, they may be less efficient. That's not, however, the nature of her accusation. Uh, the general proliferation of stereotypes, in fact, in my view, has been proliferating for a long time and has to do with German electoral politics in which the idea that the Greeks are somehow a residue of the old Gustavbeiter phenomenon is a very easy image to conjure up. It didn't help Angela Merkel in the uh, provincial elections, but I do think that this was an important uh, factor. Um, the other point about corruption that needs to be made is that what is often called cor corruption is in fact a system of patronage, of patron-client relations. And you will not get rid of such a system unless you get rid of a system which is both what I call crypto-colonial in which larger states dominate weaker ones without actually calling it colonialism, but also at the same time have patron-client relations with those states. So Greece, for example, is a client state in a system of patronage that has long before the creation of the European Union maintained the power of political patrons also within the Greek state. The Greek establishment owes its power to precisely such fellow occidental systems. And to ignore this history is to condemn it to repeat itself. 
Thus, I think what we are seeing here is something that I would call structural corruption, using the idiom of structural violence. That is to say, it is a, stru it is a structure that reproduces itself at many different levels, and it will not go away as long as Germany, France, and Britain in particular play the role of protectors of weaker states. There are also internal structural uh, uh, forms that reproduce this. For example, Greece's relationship to Cyprus, although that relationship is more complex now as a result of the weakening of Greek authority within the EU. We should also not believe that the Western European countries are immune to corruption. Another anthropologist, Chris Shaw, now at the University of Auckland, in a very important book called Building Europe, points out that the officers responsible for financial policy, while they may put forward all sorts of very impressive documents, actually tend to fix deals very quickly and admit it when a prying anthropologist comes along. He talks about some of the revelations of British officials, for example, he met in Brussels. Again, why should we be surprised? Why should we expect the European Union to be any less corrupt than the systems that have constituted it? Moreover, Shaw, I think in another important observation, says that while much of the European Union functions fairly well, and I think that institutionally some aspects of it do, the one thing that has yet to be achieved and may never be achieved is cultural integration. Now, if I wanted to be facetious, and I think I do, I would say that the European Union probably in about 50 years' time will adopt the Chinese writing system as the only possible defense against the use of English in all the countries that comprise it. But aside from such utopian dreams, we are looking at a situation in which local cultures are, are not merging very successfully with each other, nor perhaps should they. I'm reminded of the early years of the Italian Republic when one of the founders of the Italian state, the Count D'Azeglio, famously remarked, now we've made Italy, we have to make the Italians. Now we've made Europe. Some people are trying to make Europeans. But I think that's a much more unlikely prospect as long as these systems of inequality that I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks uh, obtain. Some countries also deal with the question of corruption in a more realistic way than others. Italy, for example, admits openly in the official statistics, government statistics, that 7% of its annual gross, of its um, uh, gross national product uh, is mafia-controlled money. Now, one might say, how terrible, but one could also say, how honest. Which is the corrupt view? It's not clear to me that a country that openly points to the fact that the so-called informal economy is an essential part of the working of any economy, is being corrupt. Ultimately, it seems to me that what we are looking at is a situation uh, in which the term corruption is less useful uh, as an analytical frame than it is perhaps as a stereotype, indeed. And stereotypes continue to plague the European Union. They plague the European Union because the weakening of national governments, which has certainly been a feature of, at least in some cases, of the recent history of the EU, has led to the reinforcement of various forms of localism. Some of these localisms seem to be quite benign. The invention of local script currencies, for example, in the Öresund area discussed in a recent book by Gustav Peebles, um, suggest that perhaps uh, the weakening of national currencies, the removal of national currencies in some cases, may actually lead to new arrangements that favor uh, a more social base for interaction. But it is also true that the weakening uh, of these uh, uh, national identities has led to a dramatic rise, most recently witnessed in the uh, rise of the so-called Golden Dawn in the Greek parliament with 18 seats, of an extremist right wing uh, I would say pan-European movement. Uh, I have a particular interest in the Golden Dawn because on two earlier occasions, long before they ever had a hope of entering Parliament, they chose to attack the Jewish anthropologist Michael Herzfeld, um, mostly because I had dared to say something critical about Greek nationalist aspirations in Macedonia. And I mentioned this 
because I think it's important to realize that nation states certainly created enormous problems for themselves and others. The idea of creating some kind of a forum in which those problems could be collectively addressed would indeed be very valuable. The EU is not that forum. The EU is a political and above all an economic institution. It has failed abysmally, I think, in generating useful cultural interaction. It has perpetuated the stereotypes that have served its internal colonial structure. And it should not surprise any of us today that the EU is indeed in crisis. Thank you. Standing want to sit down now. Probably a good time to just shuffle on. We don't really need people sitting on the floor. We've got plenty of seats, so please do find one. I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this um, panel discussion this evening. Thank you. Um, my discussion this evening will focus on the relationship between the European crisis and the long-standing legitimacy problems of the EU, with an emphasis on Italy. As we go, I'll be posing a few debate-defining questions, um, which I think might be somewhat controversial. I argue that the contagion from Greece to Spain and Italy of itself reveals major EU policy failure. The crisis has grown out of all proportion, and that, that's indicated, um, I think, by the magnitude of, or that, that uh, indicates the magnitude of that policy failure. It's as if the fate of the US dollar were tied to the ability of the state of Mississippi to balance its budget. No disrespect intended. Uh, while the GFC and its economic fallout are acknowledged as catalysts, three independent factors combine to present, I hope, a plausible explanation for the crisis. First, a failure of the EU over time to enhance the political legitimacy of its integration project and a failure to advance participatory democracy <clears throat> and a citizen's Europe. Second, the well-known institutional or structural deficiencies. There's no fiscal economic union to complement monetary union. There's no political counterpart to the European Bank, the European Central Bank. In fact, the ECB looks like a central bank, but it doesn't act like one. Third, the policy sclerosis and the resulting divisions within the Eurozone. While reform takes time, the Eurozone response has been slow and underwhelming. Adopting a wide lens view, we can link the current crisis to the failure of the Constitutional Treaty in 2005. Whereas during the negotiation of the Constitutional Treaty, the single currency may have been seen as a stepping stone towards political union, and let's be clear, the euro was expected to accelerate integration. The loss of momentum associated with the abandonment of the treaty meant that that perspective was lost. The referendum fiascos leading to the failure of the constitutional treaty halted progress towards economic or fiscal integration. I have no intention of revisiting the reasons for the failure of the constitutional treaty, but it's apparent that political parties have not undertaken constructive campaigns to inform public opinion. They've obscured constitutional realities about the EU and they've been far from candid about the importance of the European project. These are age-old attitudes in the EU which are difficult to shift. Leaders have refrained from talking up the European project or injecting some good sense realism into the crisis debate preferring instead to allow populists to run with stereotypes about Greeks or Germans or Italians. How lazy are the Greeks? Or stubborn the Germans? Or evasive the Italians? That sort of thing. Simplistic, spreadsheet-driven solutions to the crisis find favour in this sort of environment. Political elites have done nothing to bring about what Habermas calls a cross-border awareness of a shared European destiny. Against this backdrop, it's more difficult to inform and shift public opinion and secure the support of the media um, of the, uh, on the need for fiscal union. And there are multiple legitimacy challenges that arise. 
So what are some of those challenges? Habermas notes that political legitimacy requires that redistribution of fiscal burdens across national borders be accompanied by greater democratic influence by citizens over what their national governments negotiate. Fiscal union demands input-oriented legitimisation, voter approval. Eurosceptics would claim that there's an insufficient degree of solidarity among EU citizens, no thick identity, to legitimise European powers of fiscal redistribution. The Eurozone now finds itself in the position of, of having to come up with a convincing plan for fiscal co coordination or union to save the single currency, but it faces voter backlash. The plan it has hatched includes increased commission oversight of national budgets before they're presented to national parliaments and more coordination of economic policy across the Eurozone. As the Commission is an unelected body, this plan represents a challenge to democracy. Furthermore, the prescriptions favoured by the Commission and Germany to deal with the crisis are touchy political choices, ideally requiring citizen legitimisation. It also needs to be remembered that any fiscal union would mean a change of the rules of the game and legal changes have to be ratified in many countries by referendum. Citizens and constitutional courts are potential spoilers. Europe-weary citizens are treated out, while constitutional courts always remind politicians about the claims of national sovereignty and the limits of EU action. In any event, the EU presently finds itself trying to appease markets rather than citizens. Financial market speculation is prompting political elites to move towards fiscal union. Again, there are implications for democracy and legitimacy. People react against austerity the unravelling of the social state and bailouts. They want more say, not less. But markets are only really interested in favourable investment conditions. Markets recognise the EU as something of an enigma. They understand that members of EMU can't exercise an independent monetary policy which distinguishes them from ordinary nation states. Whereas it may be once commonly have been thought that the lack of sovereignty was compensated by something in the nature of unity or solidarity and a capacity for collective decision making, there are now some doubts creeping in. Markets have posed the questions, or the question, how safe are our investments in a Eurozone of member states? But they remain unconvinced by the Eurozone's response, by its fragmented particularistic response. So what does it mean to be a member of the EU and the Eurozone? And does it confer a valuable status? Member states are acting like nation states, absent sovereign control over monetary policy and with dwindling control over economic policy. And this is effectively less, not more. As financial markets operate beyond the control of even the most powerful states, their displeasure has dire consequences. And questions now abound as to where exactly sovereignty lies. After three years of underwhelming political attempts to deal with the crisis, we find a divided and diminished Europe, but also quite a resilient Europe. There are two opposing views playing out in, the EU, in Europe right now. On one view, Italy and Spain are deemed victims of forces beyond their control, unfairly punished by financial markets. On the other, the crisis is due to fiscal failings in the South. The second view is popular in Germany where many fear that German money will be used to pay for Spanish and Italian debts. The Germans are especially fearful of an Italian collapse, with good reason. The strange fe feature of the crisis is that Italy is not fundamentally insolvent. Public debt has been stable at about 110 to 120% of GDP for many years. Italy has the third largest bond market in the world and is considered a consummate manager of debt. A government of technocrats has made very major reforms on pensions and the labour market, public spending has been slashed and other reforms are progressing. Combined public and private debt is lower than in France, the UK, the US and Japan. Yes, there are serious political and economic deficiencies in Italy, but the country's ongoing recession is largely due to austerity, the credit crunch, doubts about the euro and the related cycle of, of rating downgrades. The real problem at present is arguably Europe, a questionable intra-EMU exchange rate and no sovereign control over monetary policy are leading some Eurozone countries to the brink. By contrast, the UK has a triple A rating and a low yielding debt 
despite having very, very poor fiscal metrics. But it has monetary independence. The debt crisis is, is a misnomer. It's more a structural crisis. In the north, German exporters are enjoying the low euro, German bonds have become a safe haven, and Germany's borrowing costs are at all-time lows. German bank deposits are increasing at the expense of the south. Far from being a victim, Germany's economy is the eurozone's biggest beneficiary and has been since the euro's inception, according to some. The eurozone can't agree on solutions. Italy and Spain favour expansion of the EU res rescue machinery and unconditional bond purchases by the ECB. Germany is opposed to both. Germany also opposes ECB intervention in the form of quantitative easing. Italy, Spain and France favour eurobonds to reduce the risk of one state being attacked by um, markets. Germany does not. Merkel sees eurobonds as a quick fix, only possible in the wider steps in the final um, steps, sorry, of a wider integration. Merkel's often accused of engaging in a national interest calculation in which Germany's interests have to prevail against the others. And this may be seen as prompting a similar approach from other national leaders, as perhaps was seen at the June uh, Council uh, meeting in which the Italian PM extracted contentious concessions for, for Italy and Spain. For reasons attached to the current crisis and its management, Italians have begun to turn away from the EU and the Euro. Giuliano Amato has stated, for years Europe represented something more, but now it represents something less. Monti warned only last week that unless the Eurozone changes course in its management of the crisis, the EU risks disintegration. German politicians reacted angrily to this comment, pointing out that Germany will not shut down its democracy to pay for Italian debts. This is an interesting perspective, given that Germany was keen for an unelected Monti to be installed as Italian Prime Minister last year. Given capital flight out of Greece, Spain and Italy, and the emergence of Germany as a safe haven, some now see the South as funding the North's low borrowing costs and prosperity. On the other side, there's much angst in Germany regarding the bailout fund. But how long will it be before the South insists that bailouts be seen as compensation for an imperfect and dysfunctional monetary system draining the South of its lifeblood? The fact that we're talking about individual countries and their national interests highlights the depth of this crisis. got some handouts which you should all have so when he starts talking numbers you've got them in front of you thanks <laughs> need glasses <clears throat> okay the talk so far has been fairly broad ranging and uh, about the general crisis of Europe and well particularly the crisis of the EU I'm going to be a rather more specific and look at the particular aspect, a narrow aspect of corruption than Michael did. Uh, and I'm going to look particularly at the global financial crisis and its implications for Europe. So it's a slightly different take, a different angle from what we've been looking at so far. In 2009, the um, chair of Transparency International, the best known international NGO for dealing with corruption, stated, quote, at a time when massive stimulus packages fast-track disbursements of public funds and attempts to secure peace are being implemented around the world, it's essential to identify where corruption blocks good governance and accountability in order to break its corrosive cycle. The important part of that quote from, for our purposes this evening uh, are the, is the first part about stimulus packages and fast-track disbursements of public funds because, in theory, what we should have seen is a big increase in corruption, at least if we can track it, uh, in, the, in the last two or three years. And what I'm going to show is, or suggest at least, uh, unfortunately none of the data are that hard, um, is that the, the picture is more complicated. I'm going to argue two things. Firstly, that there appear on the surface to be two Europes, but I'm going to show, uh, this is basically in line with what the other speakers have said, that this uh, notion of one more troubled Europe and one less troubled Europe, the more troubled one being the seven countries that are on your, the second part of the tables you've got, ones that have already asked for bailouts or are expected to in the near future, uh, 
Um, and uh, that they fit the hypothesis that an economic crisis is likely to re re result in increased corruption, whereas the less troubled states um, don't actually seem to fit that assumption. But it's, I'm going to also suggest that it's actually more complicated than it looks from the data. The other thing I want to argue is that there is a chicken and egg problem in analysing the relationship between corruption and economic crisis. I'll come back to that. Now, one or two starting points. Um, firstly, the meaning of corruption. It's a nightmare trying to get any agreement on this. Michael, for instance, referred to patronage, uh, and he, as an expert on Italy, will know that a lot of the leading uh, Italian specialists on corruption, people like Donatella Della Porta and a whole bunch of others, will deny that patronage and clientelism are forms of corruption. I disagree. I think most Anglo phone uh, analysts disagree with that and see patronage as a form of what I often call penumbra corruption. Uh, but uh, there are, there's the gen more general meaning of corruption, meaning rottenness, and there's certainly much of that, even if we find it difficult to measure the specific notion of private abuse of public office. Now, does corruption refer only to the state, or does it refer to the private sector too? I would argue here that because we live in a neoliberal world, uh, this, where the state and the private sector are in, increasingly indistinguishable, uh, the problem of identifying corruption is compounded. Um, and this is reflected, the, the confusion here is reflected in the fact that the leading organisation I referred to earlier, Transparency International, actually has two definitions of corruption. For its best known product, the Corruption Perceptions Index, it says that you must, there must be state officials involved. But for its all other purposes, it's, it, uh, it, uh, tra it, sorry, it uh, defines corruption as the private abuse of entrusted power, and they specifically introduce that change so as to allow for corruption in the private sector exclusively. Um, okay, let's have a, a look at how the uh, crisis, the global, the global financial crisis at least, appears to have affected. Uh, uh, at least some of the European countries. If you look at table one, what you'll see there is that every country in the first group, which is what I've called for the early part of my talk, the, um, the, the less troubled states, all of them are now, or as, as of 2011, were in positive gro growth. I was reading the age this morning and see that that might reverse again this year, but not yet. At the moment, all of them are in positive growth. If you look at the troubled countries, uh, we have got a couple there, uh, Cyprus and Italy. They're in positive growth in 2011. All the others in negative growth. Um, but the positive growth is all well below 1%. So there, is, there are two Europes there in one sense. Um, if you look at the unemployment figures, as your table two, um, these are percentages. Here, the picture is, is less clear cut. Uh, there are plenty of the so-called less troubled states that have had uh, an increase in uh, unemployment. Almost all of them have. The only one that didn't was Germany, and uh, Poland had a steady state over this period. Um, on the other hand, all seven of the so-called troubled states um, have seen an increase in unemployment. Well, let's now look at the perceived corruption levels. And I've used the two best known um, indicators of corruption, I have to emphasize that there is no one that can give us uh, accurate pictures of corruption. Uh, perception um, perception uh, surveys only tell you what people think. It doesn't tell you reality. However, I, as I always uh, argue in my lectures, perception is a form of reality. Uh, if people make decisions such as investing or not, uh, it, it's a form of reality. Uh, the scaling, incidentally, is on uh, 0 to 10. 10 means you're almost squeaky clean. 0 means you're, <laughs> you're not. Uh, so basically, the higher the figure, the less corrupt you're, you're perceived to be. So you see that since the GEC, which is what I prefer to call it, General Economic Crisis, in 2008, um, in five of the seven less troubled states, the, corruption, the perceived corruption levels have been steady state. I haven't moved. Whereas in the um, five of the more troubled states, there has been a marked deterioration. Well, not a marked, it varies from country to country, but there has been a clear deterioration. 
But some people say, I don't like perception um, surveys, let's have a look at experience surveys. So table four, the last one you've got, uh, is about uh, experience corruption levels. And they, will, they suggest that um, corruption has increased in, the question here incidentally is, in the past 12 months, have you or anyone living in your household paid a bribe in any form? And those percentages. So Poland is the, the odd person out there with 15% of uh, respondents saying that they paid a bribe or someone in their family paid a bribe. But all the others are very low. Um, Greece and Italy, on the other hand, had, had relatively high levels, although not noticeably higher than Poland. Uh, whereas the other countries have gone up, but it's not, it's not marked. They're not markedly higher than the, the uh, so-called less troubled states. Now, one of the things that um, people who argue in favour of experience-based um, experience surveys don't always acknowledge, in fact, they usually don't acknowledge, is that this only picks up low-level corruption. And in fact, uh, one of the problems in much of Europe is that the corruption in northeastern Europe tends to be at the higher levels. Let me just remind you that in the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen Chancellor Kohl involved in major corruption scandal, uh, Jacques Chirac, Tony Blair, um, and of course, our old friend Berlusconi, who, who sets new standards. Um, all this sets a bad example. Um, if if uh, Michael actually saw my notes, he'd seen that he'd he'd take, taken the wind out of my sails by quoting the fish stinks from the head. Uh, we're getting bad examples. What about corporate corruption? Well, um, in, let me give you a quote. And how much longer have I got? You're about three minutes. Three minutes, okay, I can finish. A uh, quote, probably nothing has tarnished the image of corporations within recent years more than the public revelation of the widespread illegal payments made to attain certain corporate objectives. Now, you might think that's a quote from the recent GEC, or just before it. That quote is from 1980. But I will give you a much more recent quote. This is from 2006, so before the GFC really burst. And this is from one of my favorite writers on globalization, Nobel Prize winner for economics, Joseph Stiglitz, who said, quote, for many people, multinational corporations have come to symbolize what is wrong with globalization. Many would say they are a primary cause of the problems. And if you look at the... Um, situation in Europe, um, you'll find that uh, the, biggest the biggest corporate scandals in recent years have actually all been from corporations based in northeastern Europe, the so-called good guys of Europe. Uh, Parmalat is an exception, but British Aerospace, BAE, huge scandal. Siemens, which uh, uh, actually has the worst record of any corporation in Europe. Uh, Statoil, a Norwegian company, that's not in the EU, but Norway is always seen as one of the cleanest countries, and Daimler Chrysler, Daimler Chrysler and Daimler uh, Mercedes had to, have had to pay enormous sums in fines for uh, paying bribes around the world. In other words, to finish, um, we've got uh, on one level uh, two parts of Europe, at least, you could, you could further uh, distinguish, but if you start unpacking it and looking a little more closely and include high-level corruption, not just low-level corruption, if you include corporate corruption as well as the state, then the whole picture becomes far more blurred. And uh, we've, we've, we've got um, uh, clearly uh, corruption playing a major role in, in, uh, in, in delegitimizing uh, the whole, not only states, but the whole economic model because one of the main things here is that neoliberalism, which has spread throughout Europe in the last 20 years, is a major contributor to the overall uh, crisis of recent years. Certainly not the only factor, but to quote uh, Transparency International yet again, this time from June 2012, quote, the close relationship between business and government has enabled corruption and undermined economic stability in Europe. I would argue that many of you in this room can think of examples in this country that resonate very much with this. Whatever happens, we're at a watershed. Europe is in crisis in its literal meaning. Whatever happens, um, neither corruption nor economic crisis will disappear in the foreseeable future. They're so-called wicked problems, which may sound like um, the sort of term that uh, uh, teenagers would use but it's, a, it's actually a technical term, meaning it's a problem that can be um, reduced but not 
but not eradicated. Are we at the end of the European dream? Are we in the European nightmare? Um, I'm a Libran, um, and I always want to s s try and take a balanced view. And I, uh, I'm also one of those people who always wants to see the, the glass as half full rather than half empty. I would like to think, but maybe I'm just being a pie-eyed optimist, that the, the crisis of both corruption and the economic crisis more generally have taught us something, that neoliberalism is now being questioned and that the need for democracy is now being recognised. But as I say, that's not based on any <laughs> empirical evidence, that's based on my, on my wishes. Thanks. OK, well, while Les uh, regains his seat and we all take breath, um, well, I think Les rather stole my thunder because uh, midway through uh, the second Michael speaking, I thought I wrote to myself, we're supposed to be talking about the European dream. These people are all talking about Europe as a nightmare. Um, and that leads me to really think in the questions I want to put to the panel um, to, to, to really get you to think about whether this is a project that's worth saving. Because, I mean, Michael Hertzfeld, you probably more than anybody else emphasised the structural corruption of, of the idea, never mind the practice of the EU, but all of you in your different ways, although you pointed analytically to, to different sources, um, all of you have been, despite Les's wish for optimism, pretty pessimistic about what's happening. So is this a project that's worth saving? Well, fools jump in where angels fear to tread. Um, but after listening to Led, I also found myself thinking, actually, yes, it might be worth saving. But the only way to save it is by getting the governments of Europe to rethink their relations with each other. Um, I was very much reminded uh, during this, this discussion of the Olympic Games, where you, know, you have a contest that is supposed to bring people together, but in fact it is framed as a contest, and more often than not, it brings out the most nationalistic feelings. What I think is happening with the EU is that those countries that are stronger are using their strength rather brutally to try to emphasize their superiority, and thereby to maintain those advantages. The Germans must be aware that these advantages that they currently enjoy are not theirs for the keeping indefinitely. I mean, this is a system that will run down in various ways, whether it can regenerate itself or not. So my, what I'd like to throw into the discussion uh, is the idea that if the EU is to survive in some viable and attractive form, this actually will require strong political action from the opposition groups in the stronger countries. I think that democracy will be served by that, they will have to insist also on more democratic procedures within the EU. But more than anything else, they will have to ask for a more democratic treatment of the weaker countries. Otherwise, those countries are condemned to remain weaker, and that means that the EU is never really going to be a union. But is that... I, I, I take that point, but I just want to, to come on to, to the other, Michael, because one, one of your, your messages seemed to be, and, and this was echoed to some extent by Les, that regardless of what the politicians, whether we call them elites and we don't like them and, you know, accepting all the things that you have all said about democratisation. I mean, the point that you were making, Michael, was that actually this isn't in the hands of the elites. This is in the hands of the market, the, that other elusive actor. So how would you respond to, to Michael's suggestion that, yes, it could be saved, yes, it could be viable, but it's about, um, you know, strong political action? Um, it, it is about strong political action. It is about... Um, coming back to the idea of solidarity in the European Union, which I think has been um, a skewed sort of discussion in recent times. I think the, the word solidarity has taken on a, a, a very strange meaning now. Um, it, it, it's almost synonymous with a transfer union, so it's taken on some very negative connotations. Um, I, I think there, you know, there needs to be strong... Um, uh, uh, action at the at the national uh, level, at the EU level, um, and um, you know the the markets will respond positively to that sort of action, in my view, um, because the markets aren't all that nuanced. They know that the European Union 
is uh, different to any other organisation, but they're not interested in, you know, it's sui generis nature which so enthralls academics. You know, they're, they're, they're much more interested in, in this idea of are we going to make money? So they're just concerned in seeing action, um, collective action at the EU, which is going to convince investors that their money's going to be safe, uh, in my view. So, um, you know, this is a very unusual situation, I think. Um, Philo mentioned the crisis um, and the perpetual crisis, which, you know, has characterised the European Union since its inception. I really agree with that. But this particular crisis, I think, is more dangerous than any other um, because, uh, you know, the, there's so much at stake now. But it seems to me that, that, you know, you've both said some very helpful things, but in a way, and I may be misinterpreting what, what you said, Michael, but I just want to push it back to both of you. In a way, the markets like strong action, but they like strong action that fits in a very neoliberal mould. I mean, you seem to be appealing to a slightly different political positioning. Well, I'm certainly uh, very critical of the whole neoliberal model. And in fact, uh, uh, as Michael was speaking, I was thinking, and let me illustrate this with a little bit of an ethnographic vignette. Um, uh, I have been very much involved, interested in problems of gentrification and eviction in Italy. And I remember talking to a member of the Comunisti Italiani, so one of the more far left uh, Italian uh, politician, the local politician in Rome, uh, and saying, you know, how appalling it was that that uh, this partic a particular case of, of uh, eviction was going forward. And he said, well, of course, it's the market. Now, I, th I think that the problem is precisely that until um, the EU ceases to be calibrated only to market considerations, paradoxically, its economic future is in much greater danger. It's precisely this talk about the market and the fact that some vague thing called the market appears to be calling the shots. And also in alliance with something else that I'd like to mention, another anthropological concept, if you will, the audit culture, which is something that um, Chris Shaw, among others, has uh, uh, contributed uh, to understanding. The fact that evaluation is done in a completely numerical way means that we can talk, for example, about one country being more corrupt than another. This is fine in the hands of an academic like Les Holmes. It's not fine in the hands of a politician who seeks to use it to denigrate another country simply to gain economic advantages for his or her own. OK, so we should do better by academics. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things we need to focus on is, is this undermining of the neoliberal model. Uh, this is one of the things academics can play a major role in. It's interesting watching how many of the leading, fairly neoliberal economists of the past have, and have now completely renounced it. I mean, you look at even people like Jeffrey Sachs, not only Stiglitz, um, all of them are beginning... Uh, even um, uh, um, Marshall... Oh, God, I've just forgotten his name, the Chicago... Friedman, uh, in the 2002, said... Uh, that he'd been encouraging a, a basically neoliberal model, a market model for the transition countries of, of Eastern Europe. And he, in 2002, said, I was wrong. I said, I said privatise, privatise, privatise. I now know that you need a rule of law and a state uh, implementing the rule of law, regulating, if you want, uh, before you, you start privatising, or at least you, you, it's got to be there while you privatise. So in time, I think we'll get a, a new model the market's got to realise, and, and it was interesting hearing about the, uh, the, the, the victory of the Australian state today against the, against the uh, tobacco companies, the, uh, which is apparently being hailed all around the world as an example of the state fighting back against big, often corrupt uh, market entities. So we've got a role. <laughs> we've got a role to, to theorise the new, the new relationship between the state and the market. But that's the state, isn't it? I mean, that, and, 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 you know, I think well, the tension... The and, and, the, and, the, and the macro state, if you like, which is the EU can be seen as a macro state. Well, it can, but I just want to bring... Phil, I want, you know, one of the things you talked a lot about was path dependence. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what's been proposed here is some viability for the EU if it does things differently, either politically or economically. To what extent can the EU break out of the, the mould that it's in? There's a huge amount of difficulty, and I think this is the problem. The, 
leaders are part of that path dependency for so long and also you don't know who the leaders are. If we have a straw poll here and I say do you think Angela Merkel is the leader of Europe, it's quite likely that many of you will put your hands up. But if you try to look at who the European leaders are, you've got a former uh, Prime Minister of Belgium, whose name most people can't pronounce, Herman van Rompuy, and most people wouldn't recognise. And we've got the head of foreign policy, Hillary Clinton's equivalent, called Catherine Ashton, who won Local Government Personality of the Year some years ago in Britain, <laughs> and whom it the State board. Department had to Google when they found out, uh, to Prugel, that she did exist, um, when she became the head of the European foreign policy. Then you've got a guy called Barroso, who has this fantastic smile in every photo you ever see, um, who is head of the European Commission. So, for example, which of them is talking about the Eurozone crisis? Well, actually, all three of them. Which of them is talking about foreign policy or about the situation in Syria? Actually, all three of them. So what we've got is this multi-headed, weak um, organization, organizational structure at the very top, which is basically not leadership and which is part of that tradition. And the problem is that the European Union has moved from its peace imperative to which it could harness a single market to a different imperative now, which is the type of basically it decided to have a soft power or a normative power imperative. So that's the second P. The third imperative is actually partnership, international partnership through something it calls the strategic partners, which by the way, it has never defined. Good academics have defined it. There's a great new book just out on it. But like corruption, it hasn't actually got a good definition. So the European Union looked around at its peace imperative, said, let's start exporting this to all the rest of the world. Let's be a normative power. And actually, it did it quite well. It persuaded 20 countries to get rid of the death penalty, for instance, using conditionality. But then it got so caught up in its second and third P, the, the power and, and um, partnership imperatives, that it lost the reason for its existence which was harnessing peace with a new type of social model, not just a market model. And then you have people at the top who actually don't know how to push that agenda and don't have the courage to do it. Partly because whenever the French and the Germans can't agree on anything, they always pick a Belgian or a Dutch person. So this time it was Van Rompuy. When it was with the European Central Bank, it was Van Duisenberg. So what you find is there is a deliberate decision not to give power, legitimacy and leadership to the leaders of the EU's institutions, who then start running around and saying, oh, well, let's institutionalize more. And that's it. they say this as their answer. And so I think it's going to be a huge problem to move out of that um, pattern and to save something called the social model, or what Jeremy Rifkin calls the European dream. OK, I promised the panelists that they would have 30 seconds to just say <laughs> anything. The chances of this happening <laughs> are so remote. However, I will urge the panellists, can you just give us your final thoughts very quickly, very crisply? Um, anything that you haven't said that you'd like to say or something that you think really needs to be said? <laughs> <laughs> you you <Okay>. start, Philo. <laughs> <laughs> this could take a while. Come on. I think the European dream um, still holds a lot of resonance. I think that um, what we need to do is to have that um, element of democracy. We, I think we have to have leaders getting off their pedestals at the European Union level and um, national leaders stop bossing some of the others around. Um, that dream still is fantastic. It has ensured peace, it has, uh, has ensured stability and it has helped in many other parts of the world as well. I would like to see the European Union continue but in a different name. I, don't want, I want to see it get rid of the word European only because that word has been associated for so long with a certain kind of racist uh, and, in some cases, fascist way of thinking. Mm. And it has certainly also been the base of some of the negative mm. images that we've talked about. There are all kinds of other ways to say that Europeans are Christian or white uh, or uh, any of the other things that have been claimed is extremely offensive, as I said earlier. And frankly, I think that unless the name of the game has changed, the recognition of the problems that the union faces will be delayed as well. So I think the union would be healthier for finding a different identity. Besides which, it faces serious problems when it tries to decide whether a country like Turkey is European or not. Uh, the question whether Bosnia is, Turkey, is, is European or not, of course, is, is a, again a purely prejudicial one. 
It has to do with the fact that the majority of Bosnians are Muslims. But when the question is raised about Turkey, um, this is clearly, this, this shows up the absurdity of using the word Europe for this entity. And I think that simply saying that this is a union of countries which have come to agree on a certain kind of common set of policies, cultural policies by all means, and economic policies as well, would be a much healthier move and would be the first sign of collective goodwill, which is exactly what's missing so far. An Irish Mike. Uh, so will the euro make it? I believe it will because it's the only uh, outcome that makes sense of the last 50 years plus of European integration. Um, and I think it's the only outcome that is possible um, in, in, uh, in Europe today. No, I still believe in the basic idea. It's, it's interesting listening to your proposal there, Michael. Um, I, I certainly think the basic idea of further integration is in itself a good thing. Uh, it should lead to better understanding apart from anything else. Um, but I also think that a lot of these problems cannot be focused just on Europe. You, it, it, it can't happen just in Europe. I mean, you're talking about the banks, you're talking about the media, we're talking about the internet, all these things, uh, and, and the, and the marginalisation of academic di dis discourse. Uh, I mean, it, it takes two to tango. Um, on the one hand, we've got a responsibility to, to try and, and, and get these messages out there. On, another hand, on the other hand, there's got to be people listening. And the media, for instance, in many parts of the world, um, uh, do not want to listen to, ac to, to interpretations that are deeper, that are more nuanced, that are more complex. They want instant bites. I mean, politicians know this better than we do. And that's a problem that, that goes way beyond Europe. But uh, we've got to address it. Well, I think this evening what we've had is a fantastic example of a very well-informed audience, both listening and challenging, um, and a really... Uh, provocative and, and interesting panel who have been prepared, to some degree at least, to, to disagree with each other and to maybe wrestle over some um, very, very difficult issues. So I just want to remind you that we do have a reception which you are all welcome to come to, but before that, would you join me in thanking our panel this evening? Thank you.